When you hear the phrase, soft as steel, what do you think of? While the word steel might conjure up images such as massive high-rise buildings, where does the soft part come in? And what exactly does this mean in our work and in our lives? Welcome to the Soft as Steel podcast with your host, Dennis Duran, featuring engaging conversations with a wide range of industry leaders around soft skills, how we practice love, inclusion, social justice, and compassionate leadership that's everlasting in the workplace. And now, here's Dennis Duran. Great conversation continues in this second installment. If you haven't had a chance to listen to the first, I strongly encourage you to do so. You'll observe as you listen to this conversation that these leaders bring different backgrounds and experiences to the conversation. It's obvious in listening to these leaders that they fully understand the importance of people, the people they lead and the people that they serve. You know, I've, I've often said that, uh, that who we are as people today is the result of everything we've experienced, everything we've learned, everything we've done, and everything we've said. Uh, and that's who we are today. And, and the real question that follows that is, does that all produce a person who could become a leader and be trusted as a leader? So let's talk about trust. Jessica, the quality of trust. How important is it? What does it mean? And is there enough of it going around? So trust is very important in, in, in any relationship, right? Friendship, family, a co-working relationship. If you don't have trust, you don't have anything. If, if you don't have trust, you're not gonna have that good foundation. If you don't have trust and you don't have a good foundation, the communication is gonna go out the window. And then I feel like that is when the issues happen, right? Because you're not open to the other facets of everybody as, as a human, right? You're, you're closed off and you don't wanna hear it and you maybe aren't inclined to have those difficult conversations if you don't trust people. So it's, I could go on and on about that, but that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, if any of you were to flip open the, the books that some of you have in front of you, you'd find that the, the number one quality uh, that I learned about from my research and survey was trustworthy, being worthy of trust. Uh, it's, uh, it's a quality that is hard to achieve, as we all know from our experience, uh, very difficult to restore when broken. Um, Jim, thoughts? Sure, on trust, the, um, the more you work together on things, the more you develop trust too. Um, and being able to work with our management partners through our trust funds, through meetings like this, you just naturally, if you're open and you like to listen and, you, and you're open to listen, you develop that strong trust and that bond to be able to tackle some really hard issues mm -hmm. and to move an industry forward, that's not easy. And you have to trust your partners. And the more you work together, the more you, you can build that trust. Proofs in the pudding. And you yeah. do it outside of not just in a meeting. You know, you get to know someone on the personal level. You, you go out to dinner, you, you know, you, you spend time, have coffee, get to know each other. That's how you can develop more of a, a trustworthy relationship mm -hmm. too. You mentioned the word relationship something which is built over time. It, it inspired the title of my book, uh, where I, my, my concept is that soft skills, the qualities of people, are what enable you to be able to build and maintain good relationships for a long time, just like the steel keeps the building up. Uh, and it can only happen over time. Uh, so you have one bad negotiation, after all of them have been very, very good, one horrible negotiation could sour the relationship at a local level in a CBA negotiation for years. Uh, and that, and those years cost both parties time and money. Uh, so again, if we think about you know, this emphasis on, on what we're trying to, to share conversation about relative to people and their qualities and how we learn about each other, how we build relationships, if there's anyone sitting in the audience that doesn't understand the, the in incredibly important value of relationships and what they really mean and how difficult they are to maintain over time, you have some work to do. Uh, it's not just good enough to do the job. It's not just good enough to set the window or to, or to finish the drywall. It's not good enough just to do that. that that's, and I, this is me, and I'm not a tradesperson. I come from the management side. But that's the easy part in relative terms. And, and in part because we do a good job of teaching that part, both in, in the apprenticeship training as well as in the field, in the shop, and the contractors. Uh, but it's the other part, uh, again, that whole person piece 
that I think is so very, very vital. Bob, what are your thoughts before I go on to my next uh, prepared question? Trust. <clears throat> Trust is earned, and it's critical, but it's earned. Uh, you can't demand it. Uh, walk the walk. Don't just say the talk, but walk the walk. Uh, follow through when it's tough. Uh, and then the last, I'd say, admit to, to your partner, whoever you're really, you have a relationship with, admit you screwed up, admit a mistake, ask for forgiveness. Versus I'm always right, or I'm always gonna put up the uh, image I'm always right. Uh, boy, does that build trust also. You know, I made a mistake. Uh, what can we do to fix things? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah. You know, research, uh, so one piece of research says that the, the smartest, smartest people from an IQ standpoint are not always the most successful people. This notion that if I'm the leader, I'm, I'm the smartest, I'm there for the smartest person in this room does not win the day. What wins the day are those average people who have higher levels of emotional intelligence, who understand themselves and have an interest in trying to understand other people so that they can take Bob's incredible wisdom, apply it to benefit the relationship. And that's what it's all about. I just want to build on what Bob said. I think Please. apologizing as a leader, the strength and build to apologize because now you give permission to everybody to apologize when they make mistakes. Because a lot of times people, you talk about that fear again, they're scared to make a mistake. Oh my God, what if the boss finds out? But if you have a reputation that you're fine, you don't, just admit it. Mm -hmm. And that also builds trust and trust takes yeah. time. But a big yeah. part of that is when you, when you screw up, you say, hey, that's on me. We've all heard it thousands of times. If you're a leader, everybody's watching you all the time. Yeah. What you do and what you say. And that's how they arrive at their conclusion about you. And again, if the conclusion is, I don't trust them as far as I can throw them. Yeah. That, that individual, to use a construction term, is totally screwed. All right, here's a prepared question. Um, and it kind of builds on a lot we've been talking about. Why does the seeming reality that each human being is different from every other human being divide us, impair us in relationships, and act as a source of unhappiness. Chris, you're up. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, the diff this is something I learned a long time ago about differences. And I, I, I'm gonna go back to a story. When I was in high school and I'm playing high school football, I remember a coach coming into us and telling us, he looked in the room, he had everybody line up, and he goes, you know, some of you are small, some of you are tall, some of you are big, some of you are little, some of you are fast, some of you, you know, are slow, some can. And in all those differences, he said, we're going to take all those differences in this room, and we're going to put it together and put it into a stew, and we're going to create a team. And with that team, we're going we're to take your unique attributes in this instance, you know, again, maybe you're stronger, you're gonna play line, you're gonna block. You're, you're fast, you're gonna run with the ball. You got a good arm, you're gonna throw the ball. You can catch the ball. You wanna hit people, we're gonna put you at back and you're gonna hit people. And I think when you combine all of those differences and all those unique attributes and, and acknowledge them, whatever they may be, you know, that was a, a sports analogy, but it works the same in our personalities, you get a great team and team is the key to all of this. And that's, I guess, yeah. kind of answer that. Yeah, well said. Jessica. So I think acknowledging differences, generally speaking, can sometimes make people uncomfortable. And I feel like when people are uncomfortable, they would rather, say, bury their heads in the sand instead of having those difficult conversations, right? We as humans, I don't think, are comfortable with being uncomfortable. <laughs> so yeah. I think that it makes it difficult when you don't want to have those conversations. But I do think something that helps with that is, you know, just acknowledging that we do, as people, need human connection. I think if you just keep that in the back of your head, it can kind of get you over that. I don't want to be uncomfortable, this is awkward situation, you know? Yeah, well said. Paul? I remember reading a number of years back of a, uh, a study that was conducted of three-year-old children, and they just were flashing photographs of different kids and people, and, and they wanted to click the ones they liked. Hmm. And overwhelmingly, the results were the kids liked 
the people that looked most like themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think innately in our DNA is that we're drawn to people like ourselves because I think it's like a comfort level. I think, I think we, we're, we're all worried about offending someone and because people are different, we're not exactly sure what maybe the trigger points may be on that. So I think um, a little bit of the fear or unhappiness is created is because we have those differences, not good or bad. But until we get um, exposure time to one another, not gonna realize the commonalities we have. So I, I think that is the source because I think it's, in, it's innately part of everyone's DNA to be drawn to people like themselves. Um, but that shouldn't preclude the fact that we'll find what we have more in commonality by having more exposure and working together or socializing together. Mm -hmm. And that's been my experience. I grew up in Philadelphia and at an early age, three of my five best friends were black. The other kid was an Armenian kid. So, you know, to me, you know, the, the diversity from, from just my upbringing was like, it's kind of hard because of how I was raised. It, it's just different than some other people may be. Yeah. Yeah. Jim? And I think to, to continue the point that, that Paul talked about, as a labor leader, we're seeing uh, the world in a different light after this pandemic, and, and people do want to come together more now because we had so much time away from each other, both in the workplace and in our communities, that like the moments now for us, and, and as a labor leader, we see it and have seen it for, for generations that um, things like race and gender have been used to divide work and people from one another. So we are constantly looking at, at, at what are the things that unite us. And in our world, it's our trade, it's, it's the skills that we have, regardless of what we look like, where we come from. And we have a unique opportunity right now, I think, to organize people into our industry around a shared set of values that have nothing to do with the things that used to divide us. And if we don't get it right now, we're, 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 gonna, we're gonna be upset with the results. Yeah, there's definitely, there de definitely is a window that's open right now that needs to be seized. Mm -hmm. Jeff, your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's been said, like-minded people are attracted to like-minded people, and you get this comfort zone, and a little bit of complacency, complacency comes into play. And all, along, all along comes someone and says, hey, we should do it this way. Well, I think the first thing you do is you, you, know, you put your guard up. It's like, oh, geez, that's not how we do things around here. But I think today, more than anything, we have to bring those guards down. And again, we have to lead that. We have to change our culture. We have to invite change. Because again, it's if you don't invite change, you're going to get left behind. It, it, it's that simple. As far as the unhappiness component, also that was touched on, is that I think because sometimes we don't know how to react to those situations, so it makes us kind of unhappy. And rather than trying to deal with that, we kind of you know suppress it. Yeah, Bob. I think a follow-up to that. I, th I think as we look at our differences and then we see problems. It's easy rather than looking inward to look outward. It's, it's because of them that we have this problem. And, and, and the use of the word them is always difficult because who is that? And it's impersonal. But once you say, well, it's because of you and you and I have to talk, so let's, cl let's clear the air yeah. versus it's those contractors, it's those union guys, you know. So I think we're always in danger as we get fearful about where we might lose something. We, a, an easy out rather than looking inward is to look outward and then blame somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I imagine as you're, as you're sitting in the audience listening, and, and uh, the term I'll use to describe it is actively listening to, a, to an incredible conversation, that if, if you know some or all of these individuals, uh, in the context of your work relationship or otherwise, you're probably sitting there thinking to yourself, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's Jeff, that's Jim, that's Jessica. Um, I'd be surprised, maybe even shocked, if there are people in the audience say, ah, that's a bunch of crap. They're just up there talking because they got the camera on them. Um, uh, the true test of a leader is that a leader speaks from their heart. Um, and you can always tell it. You, you can see it. They're, 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 these are six very different people in terms of their communication style. Um, and, you know, and, you know, Paul is, 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 a, is a very contemplative individual. Uh, he very carefully chooses his words, uh, but they're gold. 
Uh, and so I just want you to, to notice what's going on here uh, and, and why it's important uh, and, uh, and, why, and why Jim said this was a good idea to do this at FIF. That, that ultimately, that's what it boils down to. And if he said, no, I don't think so, I'd be back in Savannah in warmer weather, but nonetheless. <laughs> All right, um, really good thoughts. Our next prepared question. Why are inclusion and social justice urgently needed to improve attracting, developing, and retaining the workforce of the future? Bob, let's start with you. Well, if one member in our society is hurting, we're all hurting. So that's where I kind of always start. And if we look at all members in our industry and society, our family, uh, and you could even go globally, uh, to me, social justice is uh, critical. <laughs> and then if you look at social justice, it's not a I win, you lose. How about if we all win? So if we all have equal rights, if we all have equal opportunity, and if we all have uh, equal aspirations, uh, what's wrong with that? No, we all win. So I think, again, back to the, maybe a little bit of that fear thing. Well, if he, he or she gets something, I'm going to lose. Uh, that kind of negates getting anywhere with social justice. Uh, and, and inclusion, back to understanding each other. We get away from that us and them, and uh, we're starting to understand each other. So I don't care what issue it is, but I, I think as you get past the us and them and you look at other people. So I'm just gonna use an example. Uh, I must admit, as a boomer, when I started in, in interviewing painters about 15 years ago and they'd come in with tattoos from the wrist uh, up, my first impression was, what the heck are we even talking about? But I soon realized, get past what I see, hire that individual, my goodness, are they talented. How could I even think otherwise? So it's that, what do they look like? And then I'll add one little thing I, I use in my presentations. What we see is not what's really going on. So we gotta get past that, I see, I see what I wanna see versus what am I seeing here in that person? So I, I, I'd integrate all that together. That's, and it's critical for understanding each other. And I loved your example about team. Together, everybody achieves more as long as we, we realize it's a team. So those are some of my thoughts. Yeah. Good. Jim? Yeah, I mean, this topic is, is obviously one that, as a labor leader, I mean, um, it's like near and dear to, to the values that drive our organization. And, um, you know, I always say our membership is reflective of society. You know, we have members that politically may vote one way and, and, and another way, and you know, we're divided so much as a society around social issues right now. And I'm always under pressure from uh, um, like a group of our membership that says, wait, you shouldn't talk about these issues. Um, for example, um, I, I think it was in 2020 when uh, George Floyd died. Uh, and, you know, it definitely touched a nerve amongst the African-American community. And we did a lot of work uh, as a union uh, to try to lift up our members' voices in that because they were triggered seeing a man get murdered at the hands of the police on TV. It definitely didn't affect our white membership the same way. Mm -hmm. And their reaction to things was way different. And, again, if we're going to be an inclusive union, we have to speak up on behalf of issues that affect all of our membership. Our women members were very triggered when, they, uh, when the Supreme Court ruled um, and overturned Roe versus Wade. And as a union, we could be quiet and not say anything around social justice issues, but then how does that woman who was, cares deeply about that issue, how is she being affected and how does she feel her union feels towards her? So if we are gonna become an inclusive organization, 
we have to take risks sometimes and speak out on issues that um, around social justice and around where we are as a society that sometimes are unpopular and may not touch the membership the same way, but it's critically linked or else we won't become an inclusive organization. Yeah. Jeff. Well, I think Jim touched on a lot of good points there. And you know, the social justice component is the onus is on us to understand that and how that impacts our employees or in Jim's case as members, because that's critical. Because again, times have changed. What used to work doesn't work. I'll, I'll keep going back to is we're trying to bring people in this industry until we understand all those points and appeal to them, because now we actually have to appeal to them, come work for us, not there's a lineup outside our door. Uh, things have changed. We've got to change things different. I think part of inclusion to me is also including them in decisions. Again, you don't have to run your company like it's a democracy all in favor, but you do need to actually ask, you know, what do you think is the best way of doing things? That to me is a big part of that inclusion piece as well. Yeah. Jessica. So I think recruitment in this industry as a whole is very difficult right now. And I think that if we can, you know, have an inclusive environment that's going to allow potential recruits and current employees to realize that they have a great company that they're working for, right? They're going to want to stay at a company that makes them feel like their voice and their opinions matter. And that is going to help the whole picture because it's going to better help us serve our customers and the industry as a whole. Paul? Yeah, <clears throat> Dennis, I, I kind of feel regardless of what anyone's individual thoughts are about social justice, it's, it's a cornerstone of what our society needs to confront now. I mean, it's been inherited. It's, it's a cause of past leaderships or lack of leaderships, um, either on a political level or in, in just community levels. Um, we own it. It's not going to go away. Um, so, you know, either you go hide under a rock or, or it's addressed. And I think um, Jim and the recruitment staff uh, at the IU level and with the councils I work are going um, out of their way to try to um, mitigate the disparities of, of tradespeople coming in. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so speaking from, from you know, our business perspective, you know, we've, we've seen this issue in, in getting, and labor being tight and uh, the market being what it is. We have really found that, that uh, you know, cultural outreach has helped us a lot. And in our operation now, we have, um, in our main office, there's probably people from 10 different countries. There's, on any given moment, you can hear someone speaking Chinese, Vietnamese, Russian, uh, Spanish, Tagalog, I think I got that right, Phil <laughs> Philippine. Um, and, and those people may have come from all different parts of the world, in particular the Spanish group in our operation. We have people from Mexico, from Honduras, from Nicaragua, from El Salvador. Um, actually, we've got a guy from India in there too. So, so I see this big melting pot in our operation and I believe that these different cultures have enhanced our, our business and made us better. Yeah. Yeah, um, our speaker that gave us the uh, doom and gloom uh, economic forecast at dinner last night was talking about his, uh, his two-year-old daughter, I believe, who is an immersion program. Uh, she is, at two years old, she is learning Spanish and Chinese. And they feel you know, very strongly that that's going to be an, an important aspect of, of, uh, of raising her and rounding her out to be a person that can enjoy the broadest range of experiences in her life. That's, that was pretty impressive. I, I feel in, you know, from California perspective that, you know, maybe we were a little bit ahead of the country with that because I, I took Spanish when I was in elementary school a long time ago. So it's kind of been part of the culture there. So I feel we've had 
you know, at least you know, from my experience, a little bit more uh, emerges into other cultures. And we have, like I said, we got a melting pot of all these people from all over the world in our operation, and it. It's, it's exciting to see, and it's, it's people who, these people want to be there too. They're fired up about having these opportunities and having these great jobs and this potential to have a great career. And that's, that's exciting for me to see. Yeah, each of you, a, each of you is a leader uh, in, in your current roles. Bob, you, you, you continue to be a leader that has great effect on our industry and will do so until you take your last breath. I, I'm, I'm sure of it, uh, and it's important and needed. Um, so as you think about leadership, um, if you could reflect on, on someone in, in your life that you thought was a great leader and tell us why. Tell us about what made that individual a great leader. And this could come from any part of your life. Uh, I think this will be very instructive for us. Chris? Okay, so, so I, what I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of my dad. Right, I was very blessed and very fortunate to have a great leader and role model. And my dad, he, he was tough as steel. He was a tough guy. He was a glazer. He was a, this was a tough man, but he had empathy. And he raised us with empathy. And so that was uh, something that I learned a lot from, seeing both sides of that. And I was uh, very fortunate. Paul? Well, Chris just stole all my thunder. I also had a great. Is his father was your uh, greatest leader? It's the Greek thing. <laughs> so, uh, I'll just parallel Chris and um, an incredibly, incredibly tough human being um, that I, I'll, I'll never be able to reach that that benchmark of his. Um, and again, we're we're talking about a day and age when we like everyone on this panel of like my era, came up hard. It was hard on the job site. It was a lot of screaming and all sorts. So, because Chris stole my father, <laughs> I'll say I, 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 had, um, I, I had a wrestling coach that I was fortunate to come across. And just to give you the background, of, from the time I was 13 years old, I was working on bridges in the summer mixing lead-based paint, shoveling grit, and, and I was getting screamed at. I, I think my foreman was under orders to, to just beat me down even harder by my father. Um, and it, it was just the yelling all day, and you're no good, you're stupid Americano. I heard it all. You know, by the time I was around 15, 16, I came across a Lithuanian wrestling coach and every session he had, all he was doing was, he was your personal cheerleader. He was, you're doing good, you're doing good, work a little better at that. He would call me at home after a good match, say, I just want you to know, and he'd get on the phone with my parents and say, you know, Paul really did a good job. Like, at the time I didn't realize it, he was basically installing positive reinforcement. And that positive reinforcement, I mean, I went out of my way to impress him. Just getting that, because it was, such a, it was such a difference from the existing experiences I had work-wise. Um, years later in a psychology class, I realized positive reinforcement and what he was using. So I've tried to apply that, that lesson learned from him. I try to apply that in, in all my relationships, whether work or personally related. Thank you. Jessica. So I would say the two founders of my company, one of which is my father and the other is my uncle. Now they have always treated every single employee so respectful, right? They treat them as peers. They've always given everybody the same opportunities to grow, to flourish, to have their ideas and opinions heard. And I would say one thing that I've learned from them, and this also translates into my personal life, is, you know, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And that really, really goes a long way, and I think that ties into caring genuinely for people. You can, you can have difficult conversations, you can give criticism, but you can do it in, in a way that, that shows that you care. Couldn't have been said any better than that. Oh, thank you. Perfect. Jim. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking I've been so, <clears throat> so blessed to be around so many amazing leaders, including the people that I'm sitting with up here right now. Um, but I'm struck by an event that happened fairly recent uh, Lee, around uh, December, I was I was fortunate enough to be invited to the White House um, to meet the President of the United States. He was meeting with a bunch of labor leaders, and um, I was in I was in a room of just 12 people that had the opportunity to meet the President, and I was in there with my father and the President of the Building Trade, Sean McGarvey. And I thought to myself, I go, wow, three people from the same Glazers local in Philadelphia get the opportunity to meet the President of the United States. And the person I think of the most is actually in this room that I identify with um, when it comes to leadership because he was my business agent when I started as an apprentice and uh, Paul knows him very well. He, he was, um, I think he had his last week of work January 1st, he just retired recently, but it's Joe Ashdale, um, who was the business manager at District Council 21, and previous to that, um, the business manager of my local, because Joe was the type of, is the type of leader that if you picked up the phone and asked for help, Joe would drop everything he was doing to help his membership, and it never changed. It never wavered throughout his career, and he helped so many people's lives that as a labor leader, I always wanted to be the type of leader like Joe, so. Uh, thank you. Jeff. <clears throat> well, there's a few people come to mind, I guess, is it's, I, I'd have to say I looked at different leaders and try to emulate some of their styles and incorporate it into my own style. I guess the first one would be my father as well because he taught me at a very young age, you're only as good as your word. Uh, you know, he was a very ethical person, taught you a good work ethic. So I took that away. And then I would say the next one would be the founder of our company, Park Duroche, Merle Duroche. He started the company with a paintbrush in his hand at 17 years old, and he grew the company and he never forgot where he came from. So he was that guy on a job site would go up and crawl up a ladder and shake a guy's hand, didn't care if he had paint on it, whatever the case may be. And that's always stayed with me. So I make a point, I go to the smoke pit. I get more information in the smoke pit than I do in our office. Uh, you know, going to the job site, I say, you know, talking to the work boots on the ground. So I learned those things from those two people. And the third person that I find as a leader would be my mother. Like she taught me to always forgive. Mm -hmm. right. uh, uh, as everybody, quite a few people come to mind. One that particularly would be the co-founder of Swanson Youngdale, Vern Swanson, my uncle. Uh, humble leader. It, it wasn't about him. Uh, he didn't make it about him, even though he was a great leader. Uh, trustworthy, firm but fair. Uh, there kind of was always a statement uh, that he, by his style, you could leave his office and an hour later say, I think I got chewed out. I think he expects more of me. So that was that expectation you never wanted to disappoint Vern. Mm -hmm. uh, he, and then he empowered you. Uh, he, when I became president, he was a great mentor for me, he allowed me to make mistakes. And he had that quiet leadership style of, and I can remember just, I can think of his words like, how is that project going? That meant he knew more than I knew. <laughs> and it was time you better get up to speed and do something about it. But he let me handle it. So I, all those qualities uh, were really beneficial. Good, thank you. I hope you enjoyed this segment of the special edition of the Softest Steel podcast. The final segment will be available to view next week. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for joining us today for this episode of the Softest Steel podcast with your host, Dennis Duran. Dennis is the author of Softest Steel and a leading speaker and trainer for organizations across many industries and verticals. To learn more about the work Dennis is doing to activate soft skills in the workplace, contact him at DennisDuranSpeaking.com. Be sure to check out his book, Soft as Steel, on Amazon or wherever books are sold. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or wherever you'd like to get your podcasts. And please remember to share this episode with your friends, colleagues, and anyone you feel would benefit from the conversation. We'll see you next time on the Softest Steel Podcast. <laughs>
with Dennis Duran.